Hi, I'm Jen, and welcome to Christian Fire Poppy. Wow. General Conference April 2024 was absolutely marvelous. I cannot wait to share with you guys some of my thoughts and the things that I heard. It was fantastic. So if you remember in my previous, I did an interview with Christian Homestead and I have, I plan to post bits and pieces of it in the future, but one of the bits and pieces from that, I titled it General Conference 2024 will be marvelous. And at the beginning, I mentioned that someone had posted online that President Ed Oaks had given a little breadcrumb to ward members to listen for three general conference talks about the same subject that hadn't been spoken of in recent years. He said he will be one of three on Sunday morning. And she had guessed, hmm, maybe temporal preparedness. That was her guess. Um, well, it turns out his theme was covenants. And he actually did mention in his talk that that theme was supported by others who spoke before him. So she was right about that. I'm not sure about this hasn't been spoken of in recent years. I feel like covenants is a very common, prominent theme in general conference, but that's just my opinion. So these are some things that I heard Elder Oak say. The Book of Mormon is filled with references to covenants. God called Joseph Smith because the inhabitants of the earth have strayed and broken my covenants. See the end from the beginning and think celestial. So these are paraphrased. The notes, conference, transcripts are not out yet. So these are just paraphrased from my personal notes. But covenants was definitely a theme. They talked so heavily about temple and covenants and how those covenants will help us to endure trials. All right. So the first talk was absolutely amazing. That wonderful, marvelous talk that President Holland gave. So the minute he started talking, this spirit hit me so strong. You could tell that he had been through a lot. I just started bawling. I actually don't usually cry in general conference, but this last general conference I did and this general conference I did when Elder Holland spoke, and it was just the fact that the spirit was so strong when he talked. And I think it has something to do with this. So he said, what is not lost in my memory of a journey outside the hospital? So he said he lost his memory of that hospital experience, but not the journey outside the hospital. He said, out of what seemed the edge of eternity, I cannot speak fully of that experience here. Part of what I received was an admonition to return with more urgency, consecration, focus on the Savior, faith in his word. Let Thy warning voice go forth, bear record of my name to the ends of the earth, and take up your cross. And he talked all about the power of prayers and how he was grateful for the prayers throughout the world and the prayers in the temples throughout the world that helped him come back from the other side. Now, I actually have a friend who has some interaction with the prophet and apostles, and she actually mentioned to me that. They call President Paul and Lazarus because it was, well, obviously. I wonder if President Holland had a near-death experience. He certainly seemed to allude to it. And something else that this friend mentioned to me is that before General Conference, they were not going to come straight out and say, get your food storage and get prepared and talk about temporal preparedness, but they were going to talk about spiritual preparedness that they are aware of the troubles and the trials and the corruption and problems that are coming our way. And I think we all see it in the world and the prophet and apostles are certainly aware of it and they have spoken their voice. And that is that covenants are going to be the most important protection and help in these coming days of trial. So they talked a lot about the power of prayers too. No doubt when we are in trouble, we need prayers more than ever. President Holland said, prayers are answered according to his cosmic timetable. And this one I really liked. I hope I heard this quote correctly. He said, prayers are motions of a hidden fire. So I put him in this rainbow right here because I just wanted to remind you guys 
that this whole theme, kind of the theme of my channel is about rainbows and how that symbol is connected to covenants and the covenant path. Doctrine and Covenants 3 says, God does not walk in crooked paths, therefore his paths are straight and his course is one eternal round. Rainbows are actually full circles. You just see half. We enter the straight and narrow path at baptism. The eternal round of the covenant path is where water and fire combine. As we ascend and descend, traversing the mortal path, we try to keep the commandments. We fall down, rise up, circle around again and again through repentance and the grace of Jesus Christ. We continue on until we finally have the eyes to see what John the Revelator saw. John sees the celestial earth. There was a rainbow round about the throne. So we circle again and again until we finally reach Christ's presence in exaltation at the center. Why do I have a feeling he had this experience? President Nelson in October 2022 said, We cultivate faith in Jesus Christ by repenting daily and keeping covenants that endow us with power. We stay on the covenant path and are blessed with spiritual strength, personal revelation, increasing faith, and the ministering of angels. Living the doctrine of Christ can produce the most powerful, virtuous cycle. Think of that as a rainbow circle, creating spiritual momentum in our lives. This talk was absolutely marvelous and stunning. So Elder Shane M. Bowen, he talked on miracles, angels, and priesthood power. He said, I testify that miracles have not ceased. Angels are among us and the heavens are truly open. So he actually told a sacred story about his grandfather. It was a raising of the dead story. And this is the first time anyone has told a story of raising the dead in modern days during general conference. Now, if you've heard differently, I know that Elder Oaks had an article in the Ensign in 2001 about some things like that but I don't believe in general conference. So if you've ever heard someone tell a modern story in general conference about that, put it in the comments, but I believe this is the first time I looked it up. I could not find any other instance like this. And I think the timing of this talk was for a reason. So here are some notable quotes. He said, many today say that miracles no longer exist, that angels are fictional and that the heavens are closed. I testify that miracles have not ceased. Angels are among us and the heavens are truly open. Now, these two quotes I did get off of a church kind of general conference summary. So I know these quotes are correct. I know that while not all circumstances turn out like we may hope and pray for, God's miracles will always come according to his will, his timing and his plan for us. President Nelson recently told us to look and to seek for miracles. In 2 Nephi 26, 20, it says, And the Gentiles are lifted up in the pride of their eyes and have stumbled because of the greatness of their stumbling block, that they have built up many churches. Nevertheless, they put down the power and miracles of God. I loved Sister Dennis's talk about parables and symbols. If you've watched my channel long enough, you know how much I love parables and symbols. So this is my recurring symbol right here of the covenant path. And right here, it's my favorite covenant symbol of all time because it's the first symbol of covenants given in all of Holy Writ. It's the rainbow. And we know that it's our temple covenants that help tighten up our relationship with Jesus Christ. This relationship, like marriage, will ultimately protect us through the perils of the last days and help us to see the face of Christ while on the earth. So our learning in the temple is full of symbolism, and these symbols can help us reach beyond the mortal veil and remember things that are not readily retrieved otherwise. Now, that part is not a quote. That is just something I repeat often on here, and it went well with what Sister Dennis says. She said, Jesus taught through stories and parables. Parables were symbols for those with ears to hear deeper meanings. Now, President Nelson, he said, you can learn much from the sacred history of the Kirtland Temple. I encourage you to study Doctrine and Covenants 109 Kirtland Dedicatory Prayer. It will help you think celestial, catch the vision of who you are, who you can become, and the kind of life you can have forever. In the temple, you may receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost, 
have the heavens open, the power of God, and angels having charge. Now, that was a paraphrase from my notes, but I was so excited to hear President Nelson talk about the Kirtland Temple and about the miracles and manifestations and blessings that we may experience today just as they did. Because that has been another recurring theme that I am beating a dead horse talking about this for the last year. But this is what got me so excited to really start my channel. And this was looking at the holy timing of when 2020 and then in 2023 and the signs pointing to the beginning. And to me, getting the Kirtland Temple in our hands as the church is kind of like the beginning of these Kirtland Temple days a parallel experience, I believe, we are going to continue to see. And that's just not, that's a lot more than me just supposing that. Maybe a year ago, I was jumping to that conclusion a bit, but I feel like they are saying it more and more directly, especially at this last general conference. So with President Nelson telling us to dive in, let's get an early start on studying about the Kirtland Temple and the promises given. So the Kirtland Temple was dedicated on March 27, 1836. This was the original Holy Day stacking of Palm Sunday, Passover, and the 10th of Nisan. On this day, there was a Pentecostal outpouring of fire, tongues, dreams, miracles. And then seven days later, Moses, Elias, Elisha, and the Savior appeared in the temple on Easter day. They saw Jesus Christ standing on the breastwork of the pulpit. And the Savior said in the Kirtland Temple appearance, this is in Doctrine and Covenants 1, 10, 15. Yea, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands shall greatly rejoice in consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out and the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. This is the beginning of the blessing which shall be poured out upon the heads of my people to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. The keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, and by this ye may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. So this was from a past slide that I made a year ago when I was talking about the Kirtland Temple and studying Doctrine and Covenants 109. So it was very easy for me to pull this up and I color coded it. The only thing is I had picked my top favorite seven out of the 13 because it was hard to fit on the slide and I was already cramming in a lot, but I made another slide to show you all the rest, the six that I missed. I copied and pasted from the student manual. So Kirtland Temple Dedication. These are the promises, the blessings listed in a manual that comes straight from Doctrine and Covenants 109. So blessings. One, that his servants could go forth armed with power and protected by the angels to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Two, that he would establish his people forever against all the enemies who fight against them. Three, that the powers of Pentecost would come upon them. Now, just a note on Pentecost, that is when the saints in the book of Acts in the New Testament the Holy Spirit came down upon them, and there were many miracles wrought. The people witnessed it, and there were many people getting baptized. So four, that the servants of God would have the power of the covenant and bear testimony of it throughout the world. Oh, and just one more note. The reason Pentecost is so connected to the Kirtland Temple is because that's how the saints, they saw those Kirtland miracles, the Savior appearing, and all those blessings that flowed out, those wonderful miracles. They saw it as a continuation of Pentecost. And there are Lots and lots of BOE articles just going that expand this concept. But anyways, continuing on, number five, that the servants of God would be delivered from the calamity of the wicked and the judgments that are promised. I think we're beginning to see some of those happening. Number six, that the Lord would have mercy on the nations of the earth, softening their hearts to prepare them for the gospel message. Seven that stakes of Zion would be appointed so the gathering might roll forth. Those are the first seven, and now I'm going to read the rest of the 13. I'll just list it as these numbers that I copied and pasted. So it says that God's glory would rest upon his people and upon the Kirtland Temple. Number two, that those who worship in the temple would be taught properly. Three, that the people would grow up in the Lord, receiving fullness of the Holy Ghost. Four, that the house of God would be all it was meant to be with no unclean thing permitted therein. 
5. That when the saints transgress, they would return quickly to the Lord. And 6. That their sins would be forgiven. So great blessings promised from repentance. So in Joseph Smith's day, this is in an article in the Latter-day Saint Mac down here. It says, within a few weeks after the Kirtland Temple dedication, David told Abraham, possibly referring to the 12 apostles, that Jesus Christ was seen of them. As a result of these visions, at least 23 Latter-day Witnesses of Christ walked again among people on earth. Now, the Knight family, those were one of those people. I know that my ancestor, Newell Knight, was one of those blessed to have a vision to see Jesus Christ in the Kirtland Temple. And I have his written words. Um, in addition, hundreds of others who were present in rooms where these visions occurred witnessed seeing outward manifestations. So many witnesses and many different types of manifestations inside the temple. They bore testimony of events not seen or heard on earth since the time of Christ's resurrection when he appeared to so many of his disciples. In the face of these testimonies, which cannot be impeached successfully, is it any wonder that faith grows in the hearts of the people of God, the Latter-day Saints? So... It's interesting how the Kirtland Temple, part of the blessings talk about um, repenting and that when the saints transgress, they would quickly return to the Lord and that their sins would be forgiven. Now, remember that on Monday, March 25th, the day that the Kirtland Temple opens, the Come Follow Me that day, um, and also just the day in Holy Week, it was the cleansing of the temple and in Doctrine and Covenants 1, 17, 16, it says, and again, verily, I say unto you, let all my servants in the land of Kirtland remember the Lord, their God and mine house also to keep and preserve it and to overthrow the money changers in mine own due time, saith the Lord, even so, amen. So teaching is of the prophet Joseph Smith. I know that Zion in the due time of the Lord will be redeemed, but how many will be the days of her purification, tribulation and affliction? So with the Kirtland Temple, there is a theme that has to do with Zion being redeemed. Purification and tribulation tend to go hand in hand. So let's take a look at Doctrine and Covenants 109. Let's read a few of these verses. Verse 46 says, Therefore, O Lord, deliver thy people from the calamity of the wicked. Enable thy servants to seal up the law and bind up the testimony that they may be prepared against the day of burning. We ask the Holy Father to remember those who have been driven by the inhabitants of Jackson County, Missouri, from the lands of their inheritance, and break off, O Lord, this yoke of affliction that has been put upon them. 50. Have mercy, O Lord. Make bare thine arm, O Lord, and redeem that which thou didst appoint as Zion unto thy people. And if it cannot be otherwise, that the cause of thy people may not fail before thee, May thine anger be kindled, and thine indignation fall upon them, that they may be wasted away both root and branch from under heaven, but inasmuch as they will repent, thou art gracious and merciful, and wilt turn away thy wrath when thou lookest upon the face of thine anointed. Have mercy, O Lord, upon all the nations of the earth. Have mercy upon the rulers of our land. May those principles which were so honorably and nobly defended, namely the constitution of our land by our fathers, be established forever. Oh, this prayer is very applicable. 56. That their hearts may be softened when thy servants shall go out from the house, O Jehovah, to bear testimony of thy name. That their prejudices may give way before the truth, and thy people may obtain favor in the sight of all that all the ends of the earth may know that we, thy servants, have heard thy voice, and that thou hast sent us, that from among all these, thy servants, the sons of Jacob may gather out the righteous to build a holy city to thy name as thou hast commanded them. We ask thee to appoint unto Zion other stakes besides this one, which thou hast appointed, that the gathering of thy people may roll on in great power and majesty, that thy work may be cut short in righteousness. So I really like how it talks about that us, the covenant people, might go forth and preach to the ends of the earth, to speak up, that people can hear our voice. And one of the other things mentioned in conference was this idea of speaking publicly. So 
Elder Christofferson, in his talk, he said, he said to, he pleaded with us to let God prevail and to be public at all times and in all things. He's talking about our testimony to be public with it. He says, publicly and unreservedly declare witness of Christ. Heed his messages and encourage others to be valiant. So he was talking about being slack with our testimonies and how we share it versus being valiant. That goes right along with this Kirtland prayer. So I put this in red because it's a big warning. And this warning has to do with the root and branch being wasted away. Now that reminds me of a recurring theme in the scriptures. So these are just two examples in the Book of Mormon. And in the Bible, in the last days, we're warned that the cedars of Lebanon will be cut down. So this is a warning for those, the proud and the lifted up nations. So Second Nephi 12, 12 says, For the day of the Lord of hosts soon cometh upon all nations, yea, upon everyone, upon the proud and lofty, and upon everyone who is lifted up, and he shall be brought low, yea, and the day of the Lord shall come upon all the cedars of Lebanon, for they are high and lifted up. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, saith the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. And I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapons, and they shall cut down thy choice cedars and cast them into the fire. And then in Isaiah as well, it says, By thy servants hast thou reproached the Lord, and I will cut down the tall cedars thereof. So those are just three of a few examples that talk about the cedars of Lebanon and how they'll be cut down. So this goes right back to this idea of covenant blessings and cursings. They are for the nation as a whole, and they are for us as individuals. And as we see covenant curses come upon our nation, which I think we all have some impressions that they're going to be deserved in some way, if you look at the decisions that have been going on, um, in the public square. So our eclipse intersection is exactly over Cedar Lake. So again, this idea of the cedars of Lebanon and the idea that an eclipse is a sign of judgment over America it reminds me also of Isaiah 9-11. Now, this is very directly tied to 9-11, the event, because this was quoted by Tom Daschle the next day and repeated. This whole theme was even written on the tower that they built after the two towers fell down. So anyways, it was interesting that um, Elder Stevenson, I'm going to get to his talk, but he kept talking about the Twin Towers of the bridge. And to me, Twin Towers, those events, these other events that we see happening to the nation have to do with covenant consequences. So it says the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and join his enemies together. So we as a nation have been quoting this and saying that this is a good response to national disasters. But the Lord tells us in scripture that Ephraim and Samaria, they say this in the pride and stoutness of heart. Instead of going to God with a broken heart and a contrite spirit and repenting or changing their ways, they say, we got this, we'll rebuild it. And there's no mention of repentance or turning our hearts to God with a broken heart. So I also have a theme of where this is. It's uh, in the Wakanda area, which is known for, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, but it's known for to be a vulture and eagle gathering place. So cedars and fowl in the scriptures represent judgment on the prideful. So the Old Testament associates fowl with the judgment of God upon a rebellious people. So birds of prey are summoned to a great feast. So this is found in Samuel, Kings, Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel 39, 17. So you can look up these scriptures and study this concept. But this banquet stands in contrast to the banquet at the wedding party of the Lamb. I won't read all of this, but it's just the idea that there is a banquet that comes upon the prideful of destruction. So covenant curses versus covenant blessings. There is the feast of the wedding supper. So Hebrews 12, six to seven, we have to remember that anytime we're talking about judgment for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth 
and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. So this chastening doesn't necessarily mean that we're wicked. Um, sometimes it does, but other times even the righteous are chastened because the Lord chastens them who he loves. And dealing with you as with sons, this is related to a covenant status, a covenant relationship. And so even Joseph Smith, Christ himself was subject to much chastening to obey the will of the Father. So let's take a look at some of the chastening that has been happening in just this last week. So we had a 4.8 earthquake that shakes New York. The exact location of it is stated in the news as being, as it says right here, a magnitude of 4.8 centered near White House Station. So hmm, the White House, all these symbols that represent America, New York itself is a symbol of kind of the center of America. And interesting that the 4.8 quake was just three days before the 4A eclipse, which is another sign of judgment. And right, right during that same time, we had lightning striking this right here <laughs> the statue of liberty that was pretty wild that was all over the news so this new york post says crazy photos show boat sinking lightning striking statue of liberty during wild new york storms they've had all these crazy storms the trees falling down and it says the strongest new jersey quake in 240 years felt across new york city so the location of this earthquake it's also Lebanon, New Jersey. So we're talking about cedars of Lebanon imagery. I think this is significant that we have Lebanon imagery just days before the eclipse that makes an X mark the spot over cedar lake. So the cedar, cedars of Lebanon. He said, I felt a shake like I've never felt before. So this is one of the closest areas. And a lot of the quotes on the news have to come from people from Lebanon. And just a little credit here, I did notice this first on the Happy Lady channel. I took note, I saw her headline was about the Cedars of Lebanon, and I have been talking about the Cedars of Lebanon for a while, um, having to do with the eclipse. So I was happy, the Happy Lady pointed out this other connection to the Cedars of Lebanon. It went really well. So if we think about also the gathering of vultures and eagles, and that's what the site of the X Mark Spot Eclipse is all about the vulture fest um we have the scripture which is <laughs> all about it starts with the light of the morning theme and then it also has this theme that immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from the heavens and the powers of heaven shall be shaken so we've been seeing a lot of the powers of heaven things being shaken and earthquakes and um on the eclipse, we're going to see the sun will be darkened, the moon will be darkened, and we'll be seeing this meteor in the sky, which is very similar imagery to as if a star were falling out of the sky. And it says, behold, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles or vultures be gathered together. So sometimes it's translated as vulture, sometimes as eagles. And then this eclipse, one of the last pieces of land it touches is South Rhode Island. We have this kind of bird theme, and I loved how in general conference we sang the song, His Eye is on the Sparrow. So that was in this last general conference, and God protects and is aware of each person. So we know that if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. So that's Hebrew 12, and it reminds us that even when if we think about judgments and hard things coming upon the nation, we, we see all this these chaotic events that he also, God loves each one of us, every little sparrow. If we don't feel significant, we are. And that has to do with our covenant status, God. So again, we have this from the history of the church, this reference to the sun being darkened, the moon turned to blood and the stars fall from heaven. This just really sticks out to me because we have this event coming tomorrow. And in Isaiah, it says, 
This passage describes the purification of Zion in preparation for the establishment of God's kingdom in the last days. Through chastisement and various judgments, Israel will finally be purged of wickedness and turn back to God. And I just see so many things happening. We have red heifers and their sacrifice that will be happening um, probably soon in Israel. And I thought Elder Stevenson's talk, he gave a great bridge parable talk. And if you've watched my last few videos, you should definitely go back and watch my videos. So the last video that I posted about the lean kine, the cows, a lot of it is actually about the bridge and how this bridge incident ties into the Comet Ponds Brooks. And I'll explain more of it in a minute. But his quote from Elder Stevenson, now I copied this pretty well, I believe. He said, when you pass over a majestic suspension bridge, I invite you to remember the two great commandments. May our hearts and minds be lifted upward. So he mentions the Baltimore Bridge incident. And then he talks about the Golden Gate Bridge and the Twin Towers that hold up the bridge. And the great commandment lesson to the Pharisees to love God and love thy neighbor. Now I looked it up and this is a part of the Fig Tuesday lesson of Holy Week. So the same day that we had the Baltimore Bridge accident. And he even said directly that this was a lesson from what we call Holy Week. I also found it interesting that the first bridge he mentioned and showed a picture of was the Rainbow Bridge. Now I had talked about this we have been talking in the past about the significance of November 21st, and I found it significant, a sign on the earth that on the next day, we had this being plastered all over the news. Because of the situation on the Rainbow Bridge, the Peace Bridge is closed. I kind of felt like that was a beginning of something, and I think that was a beginning of bridge events, craziness, because as you can see here, there have been three big bridge incidents in just the last couple of weeks. So the three big incidents that have occurred over the past couple of weeks were first, the Baltimore bridge accident on March 26th. Next, we had a barge and bridge accident near a dam in Oklahoma. And then on April 6th, which was really just reported today on April 7th, was another bridge incident in New York. It was a very close call. It's very similar to the Baltimore incident where this container ship lost power. So I'll give you some more details on these other two incidents. But it's really interesting that all these bridge events are happening at the same time we have the visibility of the Pons Brooks Comet because the meaning of Pons in Latin is bridge and Brooks meaning water, Brooks of water. So this Pons Brooks Comet it's a reminder to me that we need covenant protection right now. So breaking news on 4 7 24. So today it just came out the same day the Baltimore Bridge parable was given by Elder Stevenson. So breaking a New York tugboat captain has reported container ship APL King Dow lost power while transiting New York Harbor. They had three escort tugs, but three more were needed to bring her under control. They regained power and were brought to anchor near the Verrazano Bridge. So this New York Post says massive container ship loses power near New York City's Verrazano Bridge days after Baltimore Key Bridge disaster. So right here, it shows that it lost power and slows to a halt near New York City's Verrazano Bridge. And then we have on March 30th, there was another bridge accident, and this time it was near a dam. Interesting because President Irene gives lessons from a dam disaster. So Oklahoma Highway Patrol, this is a report, says US 59 South, 
Salisal at the Care Reservoir is completely shut down due to a barge that has struck the bridge. Troopers are diverting traffic away from the area. The bridge is going to be shut down until inspections of the bridge can be made. So the barge hit the bridge near Care Lock and Dam. So President Eyring, what did he have to say? He said the Teton Dam burst and covered Rexburg. He talked all about his experience as president of BYU Idaho at that time and how it was challenging. But the spirit confirmed to him all will be well because of the temple, no matter the outcome. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So what a great example of how we can respond and what we can hold on to for joy and hope and have gratitude and praise the Lord, even in the midst of crazy trials, some involving bridges and dams. Again, this Pondsbrook comment, we know that it becomes its brightest, and that's completely separate from being at perihelion, which both of them will happen on April 21st at the start of Passover. So, ponds meaning bridge and brooks meaning water, bridges allow us to pass over the water and remember what Elder Stevenson taught us today. So whenever I think of this comment, I'm going to remember Elder Stevenson's talk that when you pass over a majestic suspension bridge, I invite you to remember the two great commandments. May our hearts and minds be lifted upward. And as we look upward tomorrow, we're going to see this comet in the sky. And then on April 21st, it will be at its brightest and at perihelion, closest to the sun. So we can remember that covenants with Jesus Christ enable curses to pass over us. Even when living in Egypt, we may be protected as individuals and families. Also on April 21st, the Manti Temple will be dedicated that day as well. So that's very exciting. And it's very interesting because this Ponds Brooks Comet is very closely related to Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Banner. So it was viewable when we had the Baltimore Bridge. The Francis Scott Key Bridge was destroyed while Ponds Brooks is back in 2024. So the Ponds Brooks Comet, it cycles around every about every 70 to 71 years. And when it was first discovered, it was actually on July 12th, 1812. And the first perihelion that we could see after discovering it was on September 15th, 1812. This was during the 1812 war. So September 15th actually was Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Banner original manuscript day. And it was the last day of the Battle of Baltimore. So what an interesting connection for <laughs> a comet that means bridge over water, this accident, and also the origins of Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem. So September 15th, he says that Key was inspired by the flag, which at the time had 15 stars and 15 stripes. Here you can see that the original manuscript date is September 15th, 1814. So seven years after the Revelation 12 sign in 2017, this sign, we've talked about it before, this is when Jupiter circled in the womb of the woman for nine months. And I find it interesting that seven years after that, so seven years after 2017, September 23rd, 2017 to be exact, Seven years later, we now have this comet. And so part of that Revelation 12 scripture, not only does it talk about the sign of the women and the stars, but it also talks about a dragon. And, you know, this is the Chinese year of the dragon. And we have this Pond's Brook, which for, long, for the longest time has been called the Devil Comet. Just recently, they have been calling it the Mother of Dragons. So... Devil Comet, also the mother of Dragon's Comet, is currently visible. And in Revelation 12.4, it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. 
And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. This comet will not fall to the earth, but it will appear as if it were like a shooting star. So I love how the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. And here are a lot of other scriptures that you can read on your own about signs in the heaven and the signs in the sun, moon, and stars. In Luke 21, it says, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. So I really enjoyed the Pillar of Light talk by Elder Dishku, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but I have talked a lot about Pillars of Fire on this channel, and he says that in the spring of 1820, the future prophet Joseph Smith was visited by God the Father and his son Jesus Christ in the sacred grove. They came in the vision as a pillar of light, so a bold start to the restoration. Spiritual experiences do not have to be as grand as the first vision to build a testimony, though. So, a general authority, he taught, rather than sending us a pillar of light, the Lord sends us a ray of light, and then another, and another. Here a ray, and there a ray. We can receive light and knowledge from on high. That light groweth brighter and brighter. We, too, can have our own pillar of light, because light cleaveth to light, and those rays will come together to form a pillar of light. So in the midst of that pillar, he says, we will hear him calling our name. He is the light and life of the world. His covenant power will descend upon us. So I appreciate that testimony of Jesus Christ. This is from some of my past slides. And I even created this awesome AI visual of a pillar of light coming out of her home. And I've talked about this because I just feel like this is a time for building up Zion. And Isaiah 4, 5, it says, it's a promise. It says, the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. So a pillar of fire. For upon all the glory shall be a defense and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge, and from covert, from storm, and from rain. Elder Christofferson talks about the sealing power in October 2023, and his footnote says that the gathering together upon the land of Zion and upon her stakes may be for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it should be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. And then there's this great quote from uh, Elder Pratt back in the day, and he says that God will manifest himself not only in their temple and upon all their assemblies with a visible cloud during the day, when the night shall come, if they shall be assembled for worship, God will meet with them by his pillar of fire. And when they retire, each habitation will be lighted up by the glory of God, pillar of flaming fire by night. Did you ever hear of any city that was thus favored? All right, so we've covered a lot today, and I had so many thoughts from General Conference. I feel like I'm just scratching the surface, but I won't put it all into this video. We don't even have the printed talks yet, so I still have a lot to share, but I'm going to wait for those printed words to come out so I can express myself more clearly. But thank you for joining me at Christian Fire Poppy Channel. So here we like to use signs in the heaven and earth as symbols of hope. It's a channel for believers. These types of signs and symbols might not be good for building your testimony upon, but they can help to give us hope because we have faith and belief in those principles and in those covenants. So one of the greatest boons for lifting hope is symbolism. The symbols of today enable the reality of tomorrow. So just President Nelson's last social media message was about having joy and how the Savior, even upon the cross, was focused on joy. I know that for me, when my body was racked with birthing pains, I could imagine the image of a baby and that one little picture conveyed more than I could ever express in words or writing. The feeling of love between mother and child, the warmth of a snuggle, opportunity to experience and learn about the great love God has for us. So if you're a mother, you know the depth of what that image or symbol means. 
And as the old adage goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. Visual symbolism can express more complex ideas than any given paragraph. One great symbol can replace an entire book or represent hours of conversation. Symbols connect deeply with our subconscious and can even bring to light memories once forgotten or veiled. For the audience who was present when the symbol emerged, symbol may serve as a time machine in the future, transporting the person back to the time and place that the symbol was created. This will then bring back to mind the vast richness of meaning and definition that that symbol represent. And a lot of times I talk about numbers as numbers are symbols along with parables. So thanks for joining us today at Christian Fire Poppy as we explore captivating symbols, celestial signs, and earthly events to help remember gospel concepts. So let's get spiritual momentum in setting goals to build Zion and watch for his coming. Thanks for joining us here, a little patch of Zion on the internet.